Waltz, waltz, waltz with a tiger Nothing you do could be anything finer Waltz, waltz, waltz with a tiger Better stay light on your toes Hi, Dave Hadfield here, and today I'm the lucky guy who gets to ferry this to Haviland 83 Fox Moth from Grand Valley to Edenvale, Ontario. It's the only fox moth flying in North America, and it has a wonderful heritage. It was first owned by the Prince of Wales, who would become King Edward VIII. This machine you see here is the new de Havilland fox moth, fitted with a Gypsy Major engine, which is being handed over to Prince of Wales on Monday. It's a standard machine, with the exception of one or two extra fittings. It has a special wireless set for transmission and receiving, special navigation lights, and the cabin accommodation is slightly more comfortable than usual. It has a range of 600 miles at 110 miles an hour, and a top speed of about 125. And now I'm going to take it up on this final test flight. I don't know how he gets into that thing wearing that coat. The cockpit's smaller than a Spitfire, but in the air, it's a graceful and surprisingly efficient airplane. It's much faster than a tiger moth. Anyway, Stan and Sheila Vanderplug of Grand Valley Aircraft Services have pulled the aircraft out, unfolded the wings, which is another story, prepared it for flight, and it's time for me to go. And as I get myself settled in, it occurs to me that this is not the first time this aircraft has been on a grass strip. The Prince kept this airplane for about a year, then it was sold to a Belgian gentleman who actually flew it to the Belgian Congo and back in 1935. An incredible trip when you think about the difficulties of doing it back then. Even airlines could just barely manage it. And after that, it became a bush plane in New Zealand. For over 20 years, it flew to remote ranches and farmsteads, delivering medicines, taking children back and forth to boarding school, landing in sheep meadows, beaches, all the things that a bush plane does. In the 1990s, it was restored back to its royal configuration, complete with red leather and mahogany trim. And in 2006, it was sold to Mike Potter of Ottawa, Ontario, and I was put in charge of its importation into the country and return to service here. Anyway, enough history. Let's talk about flying the thing. While I'm doing a last minute weather check on my cell phone, you can see some very unusual things on this instrument panel. That top oval in brass is a window so you can talk to your passengers. Kind of looks like it came off a yacht. And that vertical instrument with the red stripe, it's a primitive attitude indicator. It's a three cornered glass tube with a viscous liquid inside that tells you your pitch. It actually works, particularly if you use it in conjunction with the gyro to the left of it, which is a reed sigrist turn indicator. The bottom needle shows you if you're doing a rate one, two, or three turn. The top needle functions like a ball and indicates yaw. Okay, brakes are set, ready to tickle the fuel. That was the brake lever I just pulled down on the left. Brakes were a new thing in 1932. De Havilland was still selling aircraft with tail skids. And these brakes work badly. <laughs> they resemble the chipmunk system, but this is a much earlier design and they hadn't quite got it right. There are, of course, no tow brakes. Stan has these brakes set up as well as it's possible to do so. And at my request, we get some brake with full rudder but they're not directional like a chipmunk is. It's basically just a parking brake and it's unwise to depend on them. <laughs> okay, brakes are set, ready to tickle the fuel. It's true, gypsy major engines and moths have to be tickled before they'll start. Or at least that's the verb we use, but what we actually mean is we have to flood the carburetor into the intake manifold to prime it for start. Gypsy majors and moths don't have a direct cylinder prime like Lycomings and Continentals do. So Stan, up front, is moving a small manual handle that's on the fuel pump, while at the same time pulling on a cable which depresses the carburetor float, causes the carburetor to flood, and spill fuel into the intake manifold, 
where it'll have a nice rich mixture for start. Switches are off. Mags are off. Throttle's closed. After that confirmation, Stan pulls the prop through a few blades to suck fuel in from the flooded intake manifold to at least a few of the cylinders. Of course, as he pulls it through, he treats it as if the mags are on. Since mags can't really be shut off, they can only be grounded out. And if there's a fault with the switch or the grounding, they're live no matter what. Okay, throttle set. And we're starting on the right mag, number two mag. Clear. This particular Gypsy Major engine is superb. It's one of the nicest ones I've ever flown behind. And I'm really glad that the Prince put in a starter. It sure makes life simpler. Here's an oddball thing. The electrical switches move in the opposite sense to the magneto switches. <laughs> that takes a bit of getting used to. Okay, I'm gone. The engine manual says to idle the gypsy after start for four minutes, let it warm up, and then it's a wave to Stan and Sheila for all their great work, and off we go. The visibility when you taxi a fox moth is truly terrible. My helmet cam is about two inches higher than my eyeballs, so I really can't see much of anything. And it's very clear that this airplane was designed to be taxied on great big open grass fields and not skinny modern little pavement taxiways. And S turning takes a lot of space since the brakes are poor. One trick you can do is to scrunch yourself down, look through the porthole, and then out through one of the passenger side windows. But it's not great. <laughs> and you kind of wish you had a periscope like Lindbergh and the Ryan. A very significant factor in the operation of the Fox Moth is weight and balance because of the unusual cabin. You could have one, two, or even three people up there. You have to decide how much weight in which seat. Too much weight in the forward seat and the aircraft could nose over if you had to abort using brakes. And too much weight in the aft seat means it'll take forever to get the tail up on takeoff. And in cruise, you'll be very tail heavy and you'll run out of forward elevator trim. For this flight, solo, I've secured about 50 pounds of water ballast in four liter jugs to the forward seat. But it's all quite efficient. The Fox Moth was the first commercial aircraft in England to pay its own way. It was economical to produce because most of the big pieces of the aircraft are from a Tiger Moth. And of course, de Havilland was making many of those at the time for the Royal Air Force as a training airplane. But the fuselage, instead of being welded steel tube like a Tiger Moth, is a wooden veneer box structure. Putting the passenger cabin and the fuel tank pretty much between the wings was efficient because it kept them very close to the center of gravity. And as for the pilot being out on his own, well, he didn't care about that very much. The first major customer for the Fox Moth was a brand new startup no frills airline, believe it or not, in 1933. Hillman's Airways. Hillman had a bus and trucking company and decided to branch out. Initially using the Puss Moth, he set up at an aerodrome just northeast of London and took people on excursion flights to the resort towns of Clacton and Ramsgate. One pound. That's all it cost. It was successful and he upgraded from the Puss Moth to the Fox Moth to carry more load. Later, he expanded into the DH-84 Dragon and the Dragon Rapide and offered trips to the continent, including Paris. And that only cost five pounds. Hillman's was one of the companies that eventually became BOAC. But never mind that. Let's go flying. Hood, harness, hydraulics, okay, throttles, trims. Trim is set. Tam tension. Trim is tension. Temperature. Don't have a temperature. HTM. Mixtures. Mixtures all the way back for rich and it's British. Mags. Mags are on pulse. HTM. Pressure. Pumps. Don't have any pumps. Pressure. HTM. Pressure. 
PMPF. Fuel, selection, quantities good, pressure, pumps we don't have. PMPF, C, controls, gyros, switches. Turn the radio on. It's available later when we want it. And go. Crosswind from the left. Windows. Power lines. Let's go over that blind old biplane takeoff again. Get lined up, tailwheel straight, make absolutely certain the brakes are off, have a look at the windsock for crosswind, ease the power up smoothly with the stick hard back, correct for yaw, and in this case it's left foot, count three Mississippis, then raise the tail about six inches, again, keep it straight, let it fly off and accelerate when it's ready, keep that rudder in, and watch out for a wind shear when you climb up to the top of the trees. But aside from the blind aspects, the Fox Moth performs well, comes off the ground easy, particularly at this light weight. The wings are straight in a Fox, not swept like a Tiger Moth, and quite efficient. Also, none of this takeoff is done with reference to instruments. It's strictly eyeballs out. And if you want to check the airspeed, it's a lot easier to look at the one on the wing strut. The one on the instrument panel is always a bit dark and hard to see. I did a test flight on this airplane a few days back and all went well, but it had a lot of work done over the winter, so I briefed with Stan that I would return after takeoff and do a visual inspection pass, make sure I'm not leaking any oil or other fluids and that all looks good before I commit to the cross country. And if it's fun, <laughs> well, so much the better. Stan radios that everything looks good, so we dodge the windmills and head east. On flights like this, I use the helmet cam to record engine performance. So while climbing at 70 miles an hour, I record full power RPM, which is about 2150, where it should be, and then back to climb power. Sometimes at air shows, people point at the propeller on the left wing and say, what's that? Well, one thing that Gypsy Major engines did not have in 1932 was provision for a generator. And yet, this airplane needed one for lights and starter and radio, so de Havilland mounted an air-driven one on the lower left wing. It has a tendency to overheat on the ground, so we turn it on once we're in flight. And then check the ammeter, make sure it works. Then it's a lot more peaceful to close the canopy. So as we climb, I notice that the airspeed indicator just doesn't look quite right. It should be a little higher. I'm familiar with this airplane and power settings and attitudes. And right now the correlation between the dial and the paddle gauge out on the wing are not matching up. A Fox Moth is generally a pretty speedy antique airplane, usually over 90 miles an hour. In fact, in 1932, a Fox Moth won the King's Cup Air Race. Here are some of the competitors lined up for the start on the aerodrome. This year's race lasts two days. Captain Hope is just 
landing his plane now at the finish of the race. He won it in both 1927 and 1928. The machine is marvellous, sir. You must really give this thing four marks. The engine is wonderful. It's the new Fox Moth. That's right, sir. The uh, Fox, Fox Moth the Gypsy 3A engine, the new. Yes, sir. It's the first time it's ever done it. Hey, Hag, the WLL. Everything good and As you cruise, it becomes very clear that the Fox Moth has very little directional stability. The stock Tiger Moth fin and rudder are simply not big enough. The rigging of nearly all wooden biplanes is rarely perfect, but the Fox is quite different. You can take your feet off the rudder pedals in smooth air, but if any yaw is introduced, the nose keeps going sideways, the rate of that movement increases until you chicken out and straighten it. It would never get certified in the modern era, but it is controllable and a lot of fun. I haven't flown the Fox much lately, and there is a bit of disagreement between the two airspeed indicators, so I've decided to divert to a friend's grass airstrip and do a couple of practice circuits. So up ahead on the left you can see Tottenham Ronan Airport, where there's a glider operation. I have a good look. I see they're not too busy, so sure, I'll drop in. And after making sure there's no one in the circuit, I circle overhead so that my buddy Mike will come out of his shop and see what's going on. Yep, <laughs> I can see him wave. So back with the power and descend into the downwind. Pre-landing check breaks off for sure. Reselect the fuel to the wing tank for a backup gravity feed, but most of all, if you've got a passenger on board, make sure they move to the back so there's less chance of you nosing over on landing. These old biplanes can leave you blind straight ahead if you fly a long final with the speed back and the nose up. So I'd much rather fly a continuous descending turn to final, maybe even a slipping turn. And that way you have the whole runway environment in view until just before touchdown. And on a grass strip, of course, you're checking for lawnmowers and livestock and mud puddles and implements. You don't want any surprises. But in this case, there are some noise-sensitive neighbors on my left wing, and I have to extend the circuit to get around them. The Fox Moth does a nice, steady, dependable three-point landing. But in this case, which airspeed indicator do I use? The fast one or the slow one? Well, obviously I picked the fast one. And let's see, I'm flying at 70 and it's power off and flare and float and float and float and float. And I guess it must have been the other airspeed indicator, but finally we touch down. <laughs> After landing, the Fox Moth tends to roll straight, and that's really nice since you're blind. Don't forget this helmet cam is two inches higher than my eyeballs. The tail wheel's not much bigger than a hockey puck. Generates a lot of drag from a stern, which helps you keep straight. Anyway, time to go back and have a visit with Mike and Cheryl. And you gotta love a glider strip. <laughs> it's about 250 feet wide. Here we have a visitor. Today it looks like a fox moth. Yeah, one of those. Brakes. Oh, I guess not. It's pretty marginal. It's got 1932 brakes. That's why I didn't go up there. Fox moth, push moth. Fox. 
box fire. What's the deal on that? They might have left the keys in it, and you did. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> so you hey, gonna Cheryl? shut her down? Or you... No, I'm gonna keep going. I'm delivering it to Edenvale for the gathering tomorrow, and yeah. then the air show in Ottawa on Tuesday. But I haven't flown it for a while, so I thought I'd come over and use your nice wide grass airstrip. And it's got a new pedostatic system. And my airspeed indicator and that one are not agreeing. So I was trying to figure out what's what. Oh, that one. Yeah. So what's that, a window into the cabin? Hello, I want my sandwich. Oh, you gotta see this. Hi, Cheryl. I gotta take a picture of that. This used to belong to a king, King Edward VIII. It wasn't a king very long, but this he bought this new in 1932. It's all leather and mahogany in there. This was, after he got rid of it, it was a bush plane in New Zealand for about 20 years. Well, flying into uh, sheep stations and beaches and, you know, Taking kids to school and bringing groceries and all that stuff. No fairings on the wings or just drag city, I guess. Uh, well, the wings fold. Yeah. Oh, they fold? Yeah. The wings fold. Oh, nice. Okay. Really yeah, you pull some pins and around she comes. Anyway, I'm going to do one more circuit and then go to Edenville, okay? I'll do a video. All right, see ya. Awesome. I'm going to take a picture. Oh, would you? Hey, David. Would you go to the other side, please? Just pull on the bottom of that strut and help me get turned. Yeah. Break the worst of all. See ya. Let go. Thank you. That was the King's airplane at one time. Lovely. Since it's a touch and go, I'll do a wheel landing, and I know which airspeed indicator to use. The Fox settles on without a long float. Thanks a lot guys, see you at the fly-in at Eatonvale tomorrow.
Here's a historical tidbit which I find interesting. See those fields, those flat fields off to my right? During World War II, that was RCAF Detachment Alliston, a relief field for Borden. There were three big grass runways there as part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, but today not a trace remains. The war is over and quite literally sheep may safely graze. As we fly north, we happen to pass right by the Alliston Airport, where I keep my Fairchild 24. So I take advantage of another training opportunity and do another approach and go around. The strip's a little on the narrow side for a blind airplane like the Fox Moth. The crosswind and the turbulence over the buildings makes for good practice. And off we go to Edenvale and tomorrow's gathering of the classics. Mr. Milan Krupa is the gentleman who has developed Edenvale Aerodrome, and it's so wonderful to see someone investing in general aviation. While I'm overhead, I have a good look to choose a parking spot and check out who might be around to help me push the airplane. <laughs> I'm crossing overhead to join for 31. The Fox Moth has a great built-in attitude indicator to help you judge the flare. It's the bottom of the forward cabane struts. You fly at 70 and then flare by putting them on the horizon and hold that till you touch down. It makes for a smooth wheel landing. The fox moth has much better manners on the ground than a tiger. The longer fuselage really does help it keep straight. And it doesn't need much runway either. That's taxiway delta. It's only 1,500 feet from the approach end of the runway, and we have to taxi to get to it. Just happy to be here with a serviceable airplane. Amen. There are no brakes, you swing and you go. Dancing with tigers is more than just show. Stay in the middle, but go with 